restoration of the English monarchy in 1660 marked the beginning of a new era, not only for English society, but also for English culture. In drama, in music, in art, the century following the accession of King Charles II was a golden age for England. In poetry, too, the confident English nation produced some of its finest ever men of verse. Three in particular defined the poetic spirit of their time. John Dryden, Alexander Pope, and Samuel Johnson. Their works were often inspired by the events of their day. More than at any time before, contemporary events provided the subject matter for great English verse. But their work also drew inspiration from the classical past, from the literary achievements of ancient Rome. Together, Dryden, Pope and Johnson remain the greatest poets of the English Augustan age. This period is generally known as the Augustan age because poets of this period model themselves on the poets who wrote under the Emperor Augustus, poets such as Horace and Virgil, and they had a similar sense of being close to the centre of power. More generally, the notion of Augustinism is a useful framework for considering the ways in which these poets responded to the changing aspects of their modern world. This was a period of enormous financial, social and economic upheaval in England. You saw the beginning of the financial revolution, the beginning of speculative investment in the 1690s, an enormous explosion also in publishing with all kinds of writers coming into the marketplace for the first time, including women writers. And Augustinism was a kind of lens within which these poets responded to these changes changes critically and with a sense of the ways in which the values of the past were being altered, but never, I think, entirely nostalgically or in a reactionary manner. The elite of the time, especially the literary elite, were highly trained in classical literature and saturated with a sense of classical illusions, and so it was natural for them to express English aspirations in terms of an attempt to emulate the greatness of Rome under the first emperor. Augustus, itself a time of prosperity, rebuilding, and of a great literary revival. If you were a cultural historian, you would look about what happened in the Restoration and into the 18th century as being a time when poetry could lay claim to having public influence. We're used to the lyrical mode, I think, in the main now. We're used to poets being tolerated if they're not poets laureate. But there was a sense in which they were trying to find a way that a, a literate person of the 18th century ought to read poetry, ought to be influenced by specifically poetic effects. And I think that this may not be the vogue nowadays for understanding the poet writing in a very individual way, writing lyrically. But it's the last time, I think, that is fully available a whole range of different generic options which are exploited in usually in very successful ways by practicing poets. The restoration of the English monarchy in 1660 was greeted by many English citizens with a profound sense of relief. With the return of the House of Stuart to the throne, the wounds of civil war could at last begin to heal. Many were simply rapturous at the turn of events. Shortly after the monarchy returned, one 29-year-old poet found himself joyously recalling in verse the moment when King Charles II returned from exile to his homeland. How shall I speak of that triumphant day when you renewed the expiring pomp of May, a month that owns an interest in your name? You and the are its peculiar claim. The poet responsible for these enthusiastic lines was John Dryden. At the time, he was a young man just beginning to make his mark in London's literary circles. His work over the decades that followed would secure his literary reputation forever. He was the first great English poet of an age which is perhaps less well known than the metaphysical age that preceded it or the romantic period that came after. But it was an age that produced some of the most distinctive verse in the whole of English literary history. It was a time when many poets were keen to look back to the greatest days of Roman literature, to Horace, Virgil, and the finest writers of the early empire. The work of Dryden, and later that of Pope and Johnson, would be characterized by the same balanced, rational approach adopted by the Roman greats. And the age in which they worked has become known by the same name as the greatest period of Roman literary achievement, 1660-1660.
the Augustan Age. If you were to call the Augustan period an age of reason, I think you might find it rather difficult to square with what you will find a lot of commentators mentioning, a real fear that that wasn't the reality of the case. In 1690, um, John Locke published his essay concerning human understanding. And in that, he offers the disturbing reflection that all of our thought processes, no matter how complex, immediately take their rise from sense impressions, from experience, which might, in their own origins, be extremely anarchic. It's up to the individual to sort of marshal them, to sort them, to filter them, so that sense may be made of them. But out there, there's a sense in which things are not so ordered. And that has certain effects on the way the 18th century sees itself, especially a sense of the need for order, the sense of a creation of order, which has to take place, because order can't naturally be found. Chronologically, John Dryden is the first of the three great poets of the English Augustan age. The clarity and solidity of his finest verse was unrivaled in the later 17th century. Yet, for many, Dryden the man remains a difficult character to fully appreciate. Born in 1631 and educated at Westminster and Cambridge, by 1660 he was in London writing his appreciation of King Charles' return. Yet just the year before, his first published volume included verse praising Oliver Cromwell, the man who had forced the monarchy to flee. It would not be the last time that John Dryden would alter his viewpoint dramatically. If his apparent shift in loyalty was to advance his own position, it undoubtedly succeeded. He became well known in royal circles. And in 1663, his connections with the courtier Sir Robert Howard secured the hand of his daughter Elizabeth in marriage. In the years after the Restoration, Dryden became one of London's leading literary figures, and his work was very much a product of his times. As a dramatist, he wrote popular plays castigating the opponents of the king. As a poet, he was similarly inspired by contemporary events. In 1667, he produced his first great work, Annus Mirabilis, a poetic account of certain events of the previous year. In it, he describes great achievements of the English Navy. He also recalls one of the most momentous events in the history of the City of London. In this deep quiet, from what source unknown, those seeds of fire their fatal birth disclose. And first, few scattering sparks about were blown, big with the flame that to our ruin rose. Then, in some close-pent room, it crept along, and smouldering as it went, in silence fed till the infant monster with devouring strong walks boldly upright with exalted head. The event that Dryden described was, of course, the Great Fire of London, and his decasyllabic lines represent just one positive outcome of that unfortunate event. Annus Mirabilis is a remarkable poem. Most of the poem tells the story of the war against the Dutch, which ended inconclusively just as the poem was being written. The poem then moves on to the fire of London and ends with a prophecy that the city will be rebuilt and become the imperial capital of the world. What's so unusual about the poem is the fact that it's truly a national poem. A good deal of it is written in the first person plural. And although King Charles II is present in the poem, he stands to one side as a kind of father figure, so that the real drama is the suffering and and the hopes for the future of the people of England. Annus Mirabilis was a huge popular success, and not long after its publication, John Dryden became the state poet of England, the Poet Laureate. Yet his dignified, measured account of the events of 1666 is not an entirely typical Dryden work. Its rhyme structure was not that with which he is most associated. For his best known work, he did use the decasyllabic line, but rhyming successively in the two-line couplet, each line constructed from five iambic feet. In English poetry, this is known as the heroic couplet, and it would become one of the key features of the poetry of the Augustan age. The heroic couplet is called the heroic couplet because it was used for the English translations of the great classical epics of Virgil and Homer. That was the chosen form. So the heroic couplet has a tremendous expansive epic dignity, but it's also very suitable 
for conversational poetry, the length of the line enacts the length of normal conversational rhythms, and so it's an eminently sociable form of literature, and it's also an eminently logical and rational form in the kind of tightness of control, the balance and the logical patternings which are presented. The heroic couplet, as one of my students actually commented, is a form by which you resolve things, or you appear to resolve things. It's got a kind of balance in the couplet itself. You can work out a satisfying level of variety which is contained by that's every second line, the rhyme word, cutting up the sense unit so that you appear to have uh, resolved things, you appear to have uh, gathered up experience and concentrated a comment about it. Dryden's use of the heroic couplet can be enjoyed in what is, for many, his finest work, Absalom and Achitophel, published in 1681. Like Annus Mirabilis, it is a poem entirely of its age, and not only because of its structure. In its subject matter and its attitude, it typifies the Augustan spirit. It is ostensibly a poem of biblical inspiration. On the surface, it tells the story of the king's sons, the Absalom and Achitophel of its title, with the latter described in unforgiving terms. Of these, the false Achitophel was first, a name to all succeeding ages cursed, for close designs and crooked counsels fit, sagacious, bold, and turbulent of wit, restless, unfixed in principles and place, in power unpleased, impatient of disgrace. Dryden's harshness was readily understood at the time. The Achitophel he described so unfavorably was simply a literary device. The poem's real subject matter was political, a thinly veiled attack on those political leaders opposed to the succession of James, the Duke of York. The Absalom figure was the Duke's rival for the succession, King Charles' illegitimate son, the Duke of Monmouth, while Achitophel was Monmouth's supporter, the Earl of Shaftesbury. Dryden's great work is part of a branch of literature with its roots firmly in Roman times, a literary form that, more than any other, defines the Augustan age, the satire. The origins of satire in the classical world are rather murky and lost in the mists of time. It seems to have originated in primitive abuse and cursing and in anarchic comedy. Satire only really became organized as a formal literary mode in the Roman world with the satirist Lucilius in the Republic and then especially with Horace under Augustus, who gave satire a tremendous status which it hadn't previously possessed. Satire works by enabling the satirist and his readers to feel comfortably superior to the target of the satire. One can see this very clearly in Absalom and Kitterfield, which ridicules Dryden's political enemies and enables Dryden's allies to feel comfortably superior to the enemies that are being ridiculed. It also works in a more complex manner, I think, by trying to create differences between the audience, the satirist, and the targets of the satire. Differences that don't necessarily exist in real life, but have to be, as it were, created. There is always that fear that in creating those differences, that those differences are not fully sustainable, and that one may be contaminated by the very thing one fears, the thing one thinks is opposite to oneself. The English Augustan age was a golden age for satire in all artistic fields. The early 18th century was the time of Jonathan Swift, creator of the greatest of all English language satires, Gulliver's Travels. It was also the time when the painter William Hogarth produced his satirical masterpiece, Marriage a la Mode. And all three great poets of the age were all masters of the genre, with John Dryden leading the way. Not all of his satires were concerned with high politics. He was also prepared to turn his attention to his own professional rivals, as in McFleckner, a verse satire from 1682. Cher alone my perfect image bears, mature in dullness from his tender years. Cher alone of all my sons is he, who stands confirmed in full stupidity. The rest, to some faint meaning, make pretense, but Cher never deviates into sense. Some beams of wit and other souls may fall, strike through and make a lucid interval. But Cher's genuine light admits no ray, 
his rising fogs prevail upon the day. The sh in question was Thomas Shadwell, a fellow dramatist and bitter rival. McFleckno was Dryden's stinging response to an attack by Shadwell in The Medal of John Bayers, a satirical work from earlier in 1682. Unfortunately for Dryden, the outcome of his feud with Shadwell was ultimately unfavourable. In 1688, the Catholic King James II was deposed and the Protestant King William installed. As a recent convert to Catholicism, Dryden found himself out of favour. He was stripped of his position as poet laureate and replaced by his great rival. This change of faith, along with his earlier shift in political allegiance, has always been the subject of discussion for students of John Dryden. I think Dryden always had a sense of the need for there to be some central authority. For example, in a poem like Religio Laici, A Layman's Faith of 1682, there's always a sense in which reason is not enough. The, the, the Protestant faith in being able to interpret things on your own level by translating the Latin into the vernacular, by approaching God in a more personal sense. Dryden has always seen that as being fraught with pitfalls. It's always a very thorny path that. At the start of Regio Laici, he likens the borrowed beams, as he puts it, of nightly tapers, you know, uh, candles, which when morning arrives after the night is completely eclipsed by the effulgence of the sun. Our reason is like those candles, casting a little area of illumination when all around has the potential to be extremely unknowable and unchartable. Well, critics are very often cynical about Dryden's conversion to Catholicism. He op openly came out as a Catholic in 1686, and it was clearly politically advantageous for him to do so. It enabled him, for example, to make quite sure of keeping his poet laureateship, and as a poet quite hard-pressed for cash, the 575 pounds that that brought was very useful to him. On the other hand, it should be borne in mind that Dryden did not reconvert to Protestantism when it became advantageous for him to do this as well. In 1688, when James II was ousted by William III, it's quite clear that had Dryden opted to return to Protestantism, he could have retained his laureateship, carried on with his salary, and would not have been disadvantaged. Instead of which, he continued as a Catholic, had to pay double taxes, and lost a very valuable source of income. In the years after 1688, Dryden's efforts were increasingly devoted to the business of translation, including the works of Virgil and, appropriately, the greatest of all Roman satirists, Juvenal. Throughout his career, Dryden was attracted to and influenced by the literary masterpieces of Rome. The strength and balance of his work is testimony to that influence. Perhaps just one of his many elegies is enough to give a full flavour of his genius. O oh, early ripe, to thy abundant store, what could advancing age have added more? It might, what nature never gives the young, have taught the numbers of thy native tongue. But satire needs not those, and wit will shine through the harsh cadence of a rugged line. A noble error, and but seldom made, when poets are by too much force betrayed. Thy generous fruits, though gathered ere their prime, still showed a quickness and maturing time but mellows what we write to the dull sweets of rhyme. Once more, hail and farewell. Farewell, thou young, but ah, too short, Marcellus of our tongue. Thy brows with ivy and with laurels bound, but fate and gloomy night encompass thee around. The elegy is one of the three poetic forms that most characterizes the Augustan age, along with satire and perhaps less significantly, the poem that praises a public figure, the panegyric. For the second of the three great poets of the Augustan age, Alexander Pope, the elegy was a form of verse to which he regularly turned. And in one of his finest works, written in the year 1717, the depth of his mournfulness is remarkable. So peaceful rests, without a stone, a name, what once had beauty, titles, wealth and fame, how loved, how honoured once, avails thee not, to whom related or by whom begot. A heap of dust alone remains of thee. Tis all thou art, and all the proud shall be. Born in London in 1688, the same year as Dryden's ousting as poet laureate, Alexander Pope would be strongly influenced by the works of Dryden, 
and he shared with the older man a love of the literature of Rome. As a boy, he read widely amongst the classics. His love of books was, perhaps, forced upon him. A grave illness left him deformed and physically weakened. His adult height was just four foot six, and throughout his life, he was tormented by terrible headaches. Despite this, his poetic talent shone early. At the age of just 16, he began to frequent the salons of London's literary establishment. And in 1711, his youthful verses made him a well-known figure on intimate terms with many of his fellow writers, especially Jonathan Swift. And it was in 1711 that he produced his first great masterpiece, an essay on criticism. It was a teasing, dazzling verse, some 740 lines in length. And its subject matter was the business of artistic taste as understood and practiced by the sophisticated society of his day. It was a tour de force, and amongst its couplets are phrases that are now part of the English language. A little learning is a dangerous thing. Drink deep, or taste not the Pyrian spring. There, shallow draughts intoxicate the brain, and drinking largely sobers us again. Fired at first sight with what the muse imparts, in fearless youth we tempt the heights of arts. While from the bounded level of our mind, short views we take, nor see the lengths behind. But, more advanced, behold with surprise, new distant scenes of endless science rise. Pope's essay on criticism was a fearless piece of work, the creation of a young man utterly convinced of his own abilities. In its entirety, it offers the reader a panoramic view of the character and taste of London at the time of Queen Anne. Pope's essay on criticism was undoubtedly a tremendous achievement. It was his first great poem. We have to remember that it was published before he was 23 years of age, and it represents an extraordinary synthesis of the critical ideas of the time in order to provide at the same time a manifesto for the kinds of poetry that he wants to write and a subtle self-advertisement. He succeeds in the extraordinary task of making literary critical commonplaces seem interesting, amusing and even beautiful. With its contemporary subject matter and heroic poetic structure, it continues the tradition of Dryden. And Pope's use of satire is, if anything, even more devastating than that of his predecessor. Unsurprisingly, it is those contemporary literary figures less talented than himself who were the target of some of Pope's cruelest satirical attacks. Some have first for wits, then poets passed, turned critics next and proved plain fools at last. Some neither can for wits nor critics pass, as heavy mules are neither horse nor ass. Those half-learned witlings are numerous in our isle, as half-formed insects on the banks of the Nile. Unfinished things one knows not what to call, their generation so equivocal. To tell them would a hundred tongues require, or one vain wit that might a hundred tire. Pope's essay on criticism is a remarkable achievement for a young man of 23. It teaches its readers how to become not only critics but writers, yet paradoxically would fill them with a sense of despair about ever being able to do either as well as Pope, and I suspect that's partly the purpose of the poem. Pope's objective, I think partly, was to create the critical standards by which he himself hoped to be judged as a future poet. One of the interesting features about the poem is the way in which, although it sets out the rules for good criticism and good writing, it also emphasises that element, that superfluity, that excess in writing which cannot be defined by rules, what Pope calls the grace beyond the reach of art. And I think it's this grace beyond the reach of art, this excess, this special quality which the poem sets out to demonstrate. There is a vogue within the period for the sublime, a treatise which is written by somebody who goes under the name, although we don't know whether it was a real name, of Longinus. And what Longinus says is that the best poetic effects, the best literary effects, occur when you are not in your proper senses. You're not conscious of holding the book in your hand. You've gone into a different realm. And Pope embraces that in the essay on criticism. He realizes that there comes a point at which a very correct poet can write very correct poems, but at the end of the day, they'll not be great ones. So I think it's more liberal than a great than may appear at first glance.
if the essay on criticism made Pope a noted figure in London society, his next masterpiece made him famous. Again, it was a work of penetrating satire, an attack on those individuals who possess an inflated sense of their own importance. To achieve his aim, Pope constructed a verse narrative whose subject matter was almost negligible. A young nobleman becomes smitten by an attractive young woman and decides to take a lock of her hair as a physical reminder of his fancy. The adventurous baron of the bright locks admired. He saw, he wished, and to the prize aspired. Resolved to win, he meditates the way. For force to ravish, or by fraud betray. For when success a lover's toil attends, few ask if fraud or force attained his ends. The taking or raping of the young woman's hair provides the title and the starting point for this poem, first published in 1712. Pope's achievement was to create a mock epic out of this event, as if this utterly insignificant action was as important as a great event in history. The Rape of the Lock is based on a real incident where a young Catholic aristocrat did snip the lock off Arabella Fermor as a kind of act of flirtation. Arabella Fermor was extremely incensed by this, understandably, and Pope was asked to write the poem to laugh the two families back together again. He imagines the story to be rather like the abduction of Helen of Troy by Paris and the Trojan War that ensues, and he installs a full epic machinery, the tones, the conventions, and the mythological creatures that you normally find in epic poems. I think partly to show that the way in which the family had got things out of all proportion. The most interesting aspect of the mythological machinery of the poem are the sylphs, the kind of guardian angels that look after the virtue and the emotions of young ladies. And they're rather like the little animals you get in Disney films. They're sometimes hyperactive, spiteful, always busying themselves around the main action of the characters. It traces a typical day up to a moment of crisis of someone he calls Belinda, her waking up at the crack of noon in the morning, plying of the cosmetic powers uh, in front of a looking glass, which he calls the, the rites of pride. But at the same time as we're encouraged, I suppose, to feel that this is trivial and we really ought to be taking a critical view of this, there's an accompanying sense that there's a kind of beauty that Belinda has. It may be based on sort of very flimsy foundations, but this is the consumer society at its best. And this uh, secure vessel is depicted afloat on the Thames in very beautiful writing, I have to say. She goes out on a boat trip to Hampton Court and very unwisely engages in a game of cards with the Baron and his friends. She triumphantly wins the card game, but she's lucky at cards, unlucky in love. The Baron seizes the lock, and the rest of the poem concerns her elaborate overreaction. She is furious. He treats the snipping of the lock like a sexual conquest. She considers that her honour has been stained, and despite the best efforts of reasonable people present, an enormous fight ensues with scissors, with bodkins, with snuff boxes, and it all degenerates into a dreadful situation until finally the lock is lost. At the end of the poem, Pope explains that the lock is going to become a star in the skies. Pope describes it as in fact floating up and forming, being transformed as Ovid would metamorphose an object for its own security. This poem will keep permanent the memory of Belinda and will consecrate forever her name. It's also, it turns out to be, rather unexpectedly, a testament to the power of poetry, to keep things permanent, to celebrate things which, in their own natures, may appear to be transitory, preliminary, and so on. But it has a power of, of demonstrating that even the trivial could be rendered beautiful, could be rendered a permanent testament to a, a very complex set of forces. The Rape of the Lock proved without doubt that the 24-year-old Alexander Pope had arrived as a great poet of his age. More success came in 1713 with Windsor Forest, the poem inspired by the place where he spent much of his boyhood. Its publication proved that Pope himself was prepared to use his work to advance his own position in society. He modified the poem to include praise for the recently signed Treaty of Utrecht and he dedicated it to a government minister of the time, Lord Lansdowne. 
the society of which he was a part continued to provide inspiration for his work, especially his satire. With his friend Jonathan Swift, he regularly wrote mocking reviews of those fellow writers he considered inferior. What Pope considered to be the sheer dullness of many of his contemporaries would provide much of the inspiration for his final poetic masterpiece, The Dunciad, a long composition which occupied him until 1743. Again, the subject matter is contemporary, the London Society of Pope's Day. And Pope's satirical intentions are made clear right from the earliest lines with his introduction of the Queen of Dullness. In clouded majesty here dullness shone. Four guardian virtues round support her throne. Fierce champion fortitude that knows no fears of hisses, blow or want or loss of ears. Calm temperance whose blessings those partake who hunger and who thirst for scribbling sake. Prudence, whose glass presents the approaching jail. Poetic justice, with her lifted scale, where in nice balance truth with gold she weighs, and solid pudding against empty praise. There's no doubt that Pope's Dunciad began out of spiteful motives. He attempted in this poem to swat to death a series of his literary enemies. This will rid me of these insects, he said. It's a remarkable poem. It's partly about the dumbing down of culture in Pope's age as he saw it and obviously considers his own art to be quite detached from that process of dumbing down. But it's also about the political consequences of the commercialization of culture. George II came to the throne in 1727 and the first version of the Dunciad was written around that time and published in 1728. And this king, like his predecessor, showed very little interest in fostering an independent critical kind of art. And one of the things that the poem is doing is warning about the political consequences of a general literary culture of sycophancy and cliché. The Dunciad represents the most enduring achievements of the later career of Alexander Pope, but it was not the only one. In his epistle to Dr Arbuthnot of 1735, his satire is shot through with an unusually personal sense of perspective. His description of his own father remains especially memorable. Stranger to civil and religious rage, the good man walked innoxious through his age. No courts he saw, no suits would ever try, nor dared an oath, nor hazarded a lie. Unlearns, he knew no schoolman's subtle art, no language, but the language of the heart. By nature honest, by experience wise, healthy by temperance and by exercise. His life, though long, to sickness passed unknown. His death was instant and without a groan. Oh, grant me thus to live, and thus to die. Who sprung from kings shall know less joy than I. As a poet of the Augustan age, it was appropriate that Alexander Pope spent much of his later career immersed in the original texts of the Roman masters. His final works were English versions of the works of the Roman writer Horace, himself a product of the first Augustan age. Typically, imitations of Horace were not translations but versions of Horace's satirical works set against the background of his own times and published in 1739. The previous year, another poet had carried out a similar task with the work of another Roman satirist, Juvenal. This 29-year-old Englishman would emerge as the third and last of the great poets of the Augustan age, although his literary achievements extended far beyond the composition of verse. He remains one of the most famous of all English men of letters, Dr Samuel Johnson. Johnson was born in 1709 in the town of Litchfield, where he attended the local grammar school. He attended the University of Oxford, but lack of funds forced him to leave before taking his degree. In the early 1730s, he was briefly a schoolmaster before setting up his own school not far from his birthplace. The school did not last long, but one of the pupils that did attend was a teenage boy named David Garrick. Johnson and Garrick struck up a close friendship, and when Johnson decided to close his school in 1737 and move to London, the 20-year-old David Garrick went with him. Both men had dreams of fame, and both would succeed in their aim. 
Garrick would become the most famous English actor of his day, while Samuel Johnson would become its most famous man of letters. Professional writing had been Johnson's lifeline. He was broke and depressed when he went to London and became a professional writer. And he was essentially a jobbing journalist for about 20 years before he achieved any kind of fame or stability. So Johnson wrote an enormous amount, mostly in prose. A year after his move to the British capital, Johnson produced his first memorable work, a poem inspired by and named after the city where he now found himself. This was his updating of one of Juvenal's Roman satires, the third satire written during the early second century AD. Juvenal's satires exposed brilliantly the contradictions, hypocrisies and simple baseness that characterised much of everyday life in Rome. His observations on the power of money to influence human behaviour were especially remarkable. It was a theme taken up in Johnson's poem written some 16 centuries later. Here let those reign whom pensions can incite to vote a patriot black, a courtier white, explain their country's dear bought rights away and plead for pirates in the light of day with slavish tenets taint our poisoned youth and lend a lie the confidence of truth. Johnson imitates Juvenal in his two greatest poems. He admires Juvenal's moral indignation. But Juvenal is a notoriously topical and scurrilous poet whose works are full of sexual scandal. And Johnson certainly has no truck with that side of Juvenal. So he adopts Juvenal's basic scheme in London particularly the scheme of escaping from a corrupt city into a virtuous countryside. Johnson himself certainly believes that contemporary London is corrupt, but Johnson is well known for having hated life in the country and loving life in the town. He says that those who live in the country are fit for the country. So he is to some extent in London adopting a literary pose with which he's not entirely comfortable. And there's no doubt at all that he alters the tone of Juvenal's poem to a very considerable extent, leaving out much of the contemporary scandal and instead concentrating on the moral indignation. There is an equation which Johnson draws in London between Juvenal's sense of a Roman decay, which he contrasts with this unthinking communal celebration of London being very much on the up as a commercial power, as an imperial expansionist force. What he's really saying is that it isn't actually so much different from Juvenal's Rome, a Rome which is past its best, which is on the way down. Many modern readers are surprised when they first discover the satire of Juvenal, the strength of his language and the bitterness of much of his verse leaves the reader in no doubt about what might be termed the darker side of the great city of Rome. In addition, many modern readers find his attacks on women and homosexuals distasteful, but there can be no doubting Juvenal's position as a giant of the satirical tradition. Time and again, Johnson turned to him for inspiration. In 1749, he published The Vanity of Human Wishes, a poem based on the tenth of Juvenal's 16 known satires. Its structure is unusual. It alternates between descriptions of human character types and the depictions of real historical figures. One of these is the powerful Tudor statesman and Cardinal Thomas Wolsey. In full-blown dignity see Wolsey stand, law in his voice and fortune in his hand. To him the church the realm their powers consign. Through him, the rays of regal bounty shine. Turned by his nod, the stream of honor flows. His smile alone security bestows. Still, to new heights his restless wishes tower. Claim leads to claim, and power advances power. Till conquest unresisted ceased to please, and right submitted left him none to seize. But Woolsey's fate was the same as that of many political figures who grow too powerful, and Johnson details his eventual fall from power in a succession of merciless couplets. At length his sovereign frowns, 
the train of state mark the keen glance and watch the sign to hate. Where'er he turns, he meets a stranger's eye. His suppliants scorn him and his followers fly. Now drops at once the pride of awful state, the golden canopy, the glittering plate, the regal palace, the luxurious board, the liveried army and the menial lord. With age, with cares, with maladies oppressed, he seeks the refuge of monastic rest. Grief aids disease, remembered folly stings, and his last sighs reproach the faith of kings. Johnson's poetic condemnation of a politician grown too big for his boots and his obvious delight in his eventual downfall is strikingly contemporary in its satirical message. In the remainder of the poem, Johnson turned his satirical attention to such diverse historical figures as King Xerxes of Persia and Charles XII of Sweden. The Vanity of Human Wishes is about vanity in a double sense. It's about the futility of hoping for anything at all, given that inevitably life is full of catastrophes, disasters, and we're all going to die in the end. And it's also about the kinds of vanities we invest in our everyday hopes and aspirations and our, our wish for happiness. All of these, Johnson says, are often in some way perverted by the vain desire for fame, for power, for dominion over others. At the end of the poem, Johnson urges us to entrust our wishes and hopes to God and reassures his readers that happiness is something that will come their way if they don't actively seek it out. Pour forth thy fervours for a healthful mind, obedient passions and a will resigned, for love, which scarce collective man can fill, for patience, sovereign o'er transmuted ill, for faith, that panting for a happier seat counts death kind signal of retreat. Those goods for man the laws of heaven ordain, these goods he grants, who grants the power to gain. With these celestial wisdom calms the mind and makes the happiness she does not find. Johnson doesn't wish to squash the human desire for happiness and fulfillment and pleasure. What he wants to do is to show that Human beings have set that aspiration in the wrong places and that they're therefore inevitably condemned to frustration. So in the end of the poem, he proposes out of his own experience and out of the wisdom of tradition, the idea that that happiness can only finally be fulfilled in God. By the time The Vanity of Human Wishes was published, Samuel Johnson had begun work on the project with which he is most associated today, his great Dictionary of the English Language. This was a formidable achievement, a painstakingly researched lexicon of over 40,000 words. He also worked extensively for magazines. In 1764, he founded the Literary Club with many of the leading artistic figures of the day, including his old friend David Garrick, the political philosopher Edmund Burke, and the painter Sir Joshua Reynolds. Samuel Johnson also became the subject of the most famous of all English literary biographies written by his devoted friend James Boswell. Boswell, when he writes his life of Johnson, creates a Johnson that is uh, a literary lion, somebody that everybody would find sometimes quite effortlessly in control of this image. And yet, if you step outside Boswell, you'd find more and more a sense of, how, of the cost, the human cost that Johnson had to live of his own, to be a provincial within a society that uh, complemented itself on its elites and its pecking order. Uh, Johnson never lost his Staffordshire accent. His public persona was hampered by the fact that he was often given to sort of nervous tics and unfortunate tremors as well. And so he was not your archetypal media talking head by any means. He was in fact somebody who had a kind of rugged integrity which he never sacrificed at all. And Boswell and others have celebrated that image and the reality, I think, of Johnson the man. And I think that that established a sense of reasoned literary debate that lived on in a sort of clubbable way, lived on well into the 19th century. Because of all these achievements, it is easy to forget his status as a poet. Like his Augustan predecessors, Pope and Dryden, he mastered the handling of the rhyming couplet. Like them, he was profoundly influenced by the work of the Romans, and his satire is timeless evidence for this. <laughs> 
In addition, Johnson mastered fully that other popular Augustan poetic form, the Elegy. And of all his poems in honour of the dead, there are few finer examples than his epitaph on William Hogarth. It is entirely appropriate that the painter who brought satire into visual art should be remembered by one of the great masters of satirical verse. The hand of art here torpid lies that waved the essential form of grace. Here death has closed the curious eyes that saw the manners in his face. If genius warm thee, reader, stay. If merit touch thee, shed a tear. Be vice and dullness far away. Great Hogarth's honoured dust is here. In 1781, just three years before his death, the now famous Samuel Johnson was awarded an honorary doctorate by the University of Oxford. Dr Johnson is the name by which history now remembers him. His death in 1784 can be seen as the end of the Augustan age of English poetry. The French Revolution was looming, as was the age of Romanticism. In England, the Romantic age would produce some of that country's greatest ever poets. Soon, the calmness and balanced structure of the Augustan age would be swept from favour with an emphasis on passion, nature and the imagination. But the work of Dryden, Pope and Dr Johnson has never been forgotten. And together, their work is now fully recognised as a great age in the history of English verse. The achievement of Dryden, Pope and Johnson, but also of their contemporaries of writers such as Anne Finch, John Gay, of course Jonathan Swift and Mary Wortley Montagu, was to produce a uniquely witty poetry, but also a poetry which reflects profoundly on the poetic liabilities and public responsibilities of that wit. It's a uniquely compressed kind of poetry, not an introspective or a necessarily a narrative or a lyrical kind of poetry, but one which has the kind of fire of igneous rock. It combines uniquely precision with energy, and I think it's a poetry which creates some of the most memorable monsters in the English language. The Dunces, Charles XII of Sweden, Achitophel, characters with explosive energy compressed into heroic couplets. Within the Augustan period, there's a sense in which you find individual poets actually finding a code within satire to talk about a sense of exile. Uh, the sociological term nowadays would be anime, a sense of being not quite part of the public and the mainstream. It sounds contradictory, but they indeed talked in a very public mode, but felt as if they were uh, disjoined from it. When Swift went back to Ireland, from 1714 onwards and wrote Gulliver's Travels and wrote many of his very personable and also very individualistic poems. He's exploring a sense of, of why the self has been fractured. Same with Pope in the 1730s. So I think increasingly there's a sort of dark underside of alienation, which is common to most of the really successful poets of the Augustan period. In my view, this period sees the development of many of the institutions of modern society that we take for granted. Banking, a consumer society, a strong middle-class culture, party politics, journalism, a professional literary class. Yet the greatest writers of the period, as we've seen, are essentially traditionists. They believe in aristocratic and landed values, they come from an orthodox Christian background, and they're classicist in their approach to literature. They therefore confront these new developments in a rather ambiguous way. They're certainly not entirely against everything that's happening in their time, but they're far from being advocates of it either. I find the special fascination of the literature of this period in the power and wit with which these great traditionist writers confront their emerging new society.